Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Kratz. I am thrilled you are here with us today. Our purpose is to share stories, ideas, and tools to help you on your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Let's meet this week's guest. So excited to have my friend and longtime ally, uh, Jackie Ferguson, join us today. Jackie is the co-founder and head of content and programming for the Diversity Movement, an organization that creates stronger business outcomes through strengthening culture and belonging. She is a certified diversity executive, national speaker, author of the book, The Inclusive Language Handbook, which I absolutely love, and host of top-rated diversity podcast, Diversity Beyond the Checkbox, which I've had a chance to be on. And she's a member of the Forbes Business Council and National Diversity Council. She's been published by Forbes and alumni and other publications and has been volunteering with and donating to a quality organization for more than two decades. Yay, Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Julie. I'm so glad to be here. Ah, I just, I, I love, well, first of all, the diversity movement for everybody, you got to check it out. It's a great portal with tons of resources for DEI. And what I love about your work and the inclusive language handbook is you take something that can be somewhat nebulous, somewhat, you know, academic with the DEI work, and you make it super practical so that people know what to say and do to show they want to be inclusive. I'm curious, Jackie, what got you started into this work? Like what led you to the diversity movement and publishing these great books and podcasts? So, Julia, I always say that I was born into diversity, right? My family is multiracial, multigenerational, multiregional. So even just around my dinner table, I got to hear perspectives that were very different about the same topic, the same current event, and different based on those life experiences. And so understanding how to listen and then also how to communicate was an early skill that I had to develop, right? With, with my own family. I got into the diversity movement um, because we were working at a marketing uh, agency and what we were discovering, uh, several of us, uh, so it was just our our co-founder. So just a handful of us that we were discovering that, you know, marketing agencies very often don't message the full consumer base, right? Our society is becoming more and more diverse. And so because we were naturally diverse, we were doing that better than a lot of other uh, agencies. And so we were creating courses for, you know, marketing, for professional development and things like that. And our CEO said, let's create a diversity and inclusion course. Well, because I had some background in DEI, uh, working in HR in my past, working in marketing in my past, um, I volunteered to, to take, you know, take lead on the course. And we created a course um, that was well received. And then our clients were asking, okay, great, what's next? And so that's how the diversity movement <laughs> was born. Oh, I love the yeah. just organic, uh, natural way that happened. And so many of us are born into this work. And yeah. whether it's your family, your friends, like, some sort of window or mirror of your own experience of inclusion or exclusion um, brings us into this work. So love that. And listening around the dinner table is still a challenge. I know for many people, like, how do I deal with uncle so-and-so? And it's like, That's oh, right. Dear. Absolutely. <laughs> we all Absolutely. have that. Um, so tell us, Jackie, with inclusive language and the handbook y'all have created, um, so many great tools that you unpack here. Maybe just start with the basics. Like what are some things that people can show through their own language and own behavior that they want to be more inclusive? What are some words, um, some language that you recommend? And um, maybe we can dig into some language to steer from yeah. now, away from after that. Absolutely. Well, Julie, the, the first thing that I want to say is, when you commit to practicing inclusive language, you're not always going to get it right. So you just need to lean into that, get comfortable with that, understand that the most important thing is when you mess up, apologize, ask for guidance, and then do it better next time. So some of the things that we have listed in the book is we want to avoid gendered language. That's one that 
you know, I certainly tripped over uh, quite a bit um, and, and something that we hear that's that's very common. But as we know, there are more than two genders, right? So you often hear ladies and gentlemen or a group of people referred to as guys. And, and that certainly coming from the Northeast, that was one that I, you know, was a mistake I made over and over and over and over. And it really took me about a year to work out of calling everyone in a group guys. Um, but we want to make sure that we're acknowledging that there are more than two genders, right? There are people who are non-binary or gender fluid, and we want to make sure that they feel included and we can make them feel excluded in our greeting, right? It's something that simple, but starting with team or everyone. Hello, everyone is how I always introduce myself now um, when I'm speaking to groups. Um, that's a, an easy way to change your language to make sure that you're being more inclusive. Um, another thing is we want to make sure that we're using best practices around other identities. So the most important thing is ask people how they want to be referred. So, you know, when you think about um, people with disabilities, when you think about people who, um, you know, have different gender identities than you're used to, um, ask, just ask, because people so often are more than willing to help you with language that makes them feel uh, valued and respected and safe. Um, and, you know, you just want to, you just want to ask. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and don't put the ownership on the other party that's maybe already marginalized. To ed do all the education. There is a great mm -hmm. book here that you can read very quickly <laughs> and get some primer on that. Um, I really like it when clients show that they've taken a step like, hey, I see this about pronouns, but I'm not sure why I should share mine. Or can you help me understand why that's important? And then you're coming at it from a curiosity perspective rather than a defensive judgmental perspective. And absolutely, I love what you said too, Jackie, like you're going to make a mistake and just mm -hmm. own it. Apologize. Don't make it all about you when you apologize. It doesn't have to be this shamey apology. Just I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. It's really what folks want to hear. Uh, the word guys, I know I, I like try to take it out of my vocabulary <laughs> and it finds its way back in. And I struggle with that still doing this work. Uh, I'm curious, Jackie, because I get pushback sometimes like, oh, y'all are being so nitpicky with this mm -hmm. language. Like, guys, like, what does it really matter? Like, we're at yeah. work. It's like, well, what are some of the words we want to steer clear of if we want to be better allies like guys? Um, you know, I think of the word master and how that's used problematically too, but what are some other watch outs that we just, now that we want to focus on it, cause the more we focus on it, the more we'll say it, but like, these are just things you, if you, if it slips out of your mouth, you can mm -hmm. take it back, you can own it. You can apologize and do better next time. Well, Julie, one of the things that I say steer clear of is the word normal, right? That's the biggest one because it makes people feel othered. It makes them feel outside and you don't want to do that. So what does normal even mean, right? Depends on who you're talking to. Dep there's, there's so much that is now normal, right? In, in people, in experiences and families and right. And so don't use that word at all. Um, and then the next thing is, you know, you just want to make sure that you're using words that some phrases um you don't want to use phrases and words that trigger traumatic experiences so one of the things and I, i'm going to use a lot of the ones that that i'm guilty of right <laughs> and it's that i'm i'm starving right so we say that when we skip breakfast and we're really not starving we've skipped breakfast right and we're hungry but for people that are in earshot of that or people that we're speaking to, they could have really experienced food insecurity or may be currently experiencing food insecurity. And you just don't know all the time. And that can bring just some negative feelings back and some trauma back to them. And really ultimately what you wanna do with inclusive language is avoid uh, offending people unnecessarily. You want to avoid bringing back 
old trauma. Um, you know, another, another one is, you know, calling a, uh, brainstorming session, a war room, right. For people that are veterans, my brainstorming session is not a war room. <laughs> there's, there's nothing about what I'm doing in that room that puts my life on the line. That makes me, that's, that's a real, I mean, real situations, real fear of life and death and nothing about what I'm, ha what's happening in, in a boardroom or a conference room is, has to do with war. Right. And so it's not, you know, a lot of times you get Julie people that are saying, oh, it's, it's so much like what, why do, are we, you know, nitpicking as you said, but really we don't want to distract people from our message, right? For those of us that are leaders, for those of us that are speakers, don't distract people from your message for those of us that are interviewing, right? Cause we're going through this great resignation now. And it's so important. It's always important, but especially now, that we're hiring the best and brightest in every role. It matters. And so we don't want to be in a situation where we unintentionally offend someone. Yeah. I mean, have the information so that, so that, you know, to steer clear of certain words um, that could make people feel othered or make them feel unsafe. Yep. Um, well, you've given some that. good examples, normal gendered language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We tend to overly focus on American culture too. I see a lot of knock it out of the park, rock star, you know, that's that right too. And just watching because it sends signals to who you're attracting to those positions, who you're rewarding inside organizations, who you're likely promoting. And mm -hmm. so all of these micro behaviors with our language really has a cumulative effect um, and, and signals to folks. I I'm curious, Jackie, with the, you know, this great resignation at the same time, we're seeing a bit of a tick down in our economic outlook. Um, where, how do you reconcile that? Because employees on one hand want purpose in their work, but there may not be, you know, as much to select from in the job pool. At least, you know, we're seeing some layoffs in tech and things like that. I'm curious how you position DEI work right now when we're kind of at a spot where it's like a yes and situation with the yep. economy and people still wanting purpose and inclusion in their work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, people are talking about that potential economic downturn. Fortunately, a lot of economists are saying that it will not be a long economic downturn. So that's good news. But, you know, I am getting the question from more and more organizations and more and more leaders, how do we prioritize DEI when we've got to make some cuts or we have to think about where those cuts come first. And what I recommend is, you know, you want to think about DEI as an imperative. It's not an option. And the reason why is because there are a lot of things. One, from the CMO's perspective, so I'll go through the C-suite a little bit. From the CMO's perspective, people are going to be more intentional about where they spend their free money, right? And so you want to make sure that your brand aligns with their values because they care about that. Your consumers care about that. And then again, as our society gets more and more diverse, which it is, how are you increasing your market share? You're going to have to do that in order for that revenue to continue to come in. So making sure that you're prioritizing DEI matters to the CMO from your brand and reputation and then from your market share. When you think about the CFO, they're very focused on compliance, right? Which is very important from the perspective of if, you, if there's an economic downturn, you don't have money for frivolous lawsuits, right? So you want to make sure that your DEI program is ensuring that you're not getting sued for, um, you know, uh, all of the things that that can occur from an HR perspective, like, um, you know, discrimination, harassment. You want to make sure your DEI practice is strong. That's why CFOs care about it. When you're thinking about um, your CEO, they care about profitability, right? That's... That's what they're reporting on, right? When they're reporting up to the board, profitability matters. And so 
uh, there was an Oxford study that showed that happy employees, right? Employees that feel that sense of belonging at work, that sense of value in their contribution are 13% more productive. And what that means is that that's an hour day of productive work. So if you extrapolate that over the course of a year per employee, giving them, you know, the three weeks average of PTO, it's 256 hours a year per happy employee. And then there's no additional overhead, right? You're just creating those programs and and those policies and those practices that make them feel valued. So then 256 hours per happy employee per year, that is a lot of extra work. So then you've got more profitability there. So as you, and, and you can go through each of those, those C-suite leaders and see how DEI matters to them and matters to them even during economic downturn because they've got to be more precise, right? CHRO, if you if you can only hire a very few people, you need the best and the brightest. You need the top folks co- wanting to come and work with your organization because you've only got, you know, potentially three spots to fill. You don't want to fill those with people that are there to, you know, punch the clock. You want game changers in those roles. And you certainly don't want those people working for your competitors. And so. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and shopping at uh, competitive uh, products. That's, right. that's yeah. exactly right. And so uh, that's, that's what I talk to people about, Julie, is really understanding the continued value from the, the perspective of those making those cuts and why DEI should not be a part of the things that, you know, you're turning down. Yeah. Um, I love what you said. I mean, 260 downturn. hours, yeah, extra year. Who doesn't want that, right? Mm-hmm. Top line. But then also th- and with production, like think about the quality of the the work that people create when they okay. feel a sense of purpose and feel connected to your organization. Same so way. it's it's really from all those vantage points too about risk aversion, um, you know, at how much you can take on, you have to be a lot more choosy, sometimes with less resources. So all of that actually supports investing in DEI now more than ever. I wonder, Jackie, with the clients that you're seeing um, in the diversity movement and the questions folks are asking on the portal, what seems to be the hot topic with DEI right now? What are some trends you're seeing? Mm. So one is certainly the e- economy. Another is global DEI. So you mentioned that often we look at things from an American perspective. That's so true. But businesses are are functioning on a global level, right? International business is bigger than it's ever been. And especially with our opportunity to connect via, um, you know, Zoom and Teams and all of those different platforms, global business is big. So you have to understand how DEI applies not only to your communities and your environment, but, you know, reaching across to the other countries that your organization might be dealing with and understanding, you know, how those are different, you know, how those experiences are different, how um, words are different, how, um, you know, what's acceptable in different societies is different. And so you have to understand um, a little bit more, about how to relate to people and and how people relate and communicate to you as well. So global DEI uh, is another big one. You know, something that I would say is never going away is the the unconscious bias conversation because we all have unconscious bias, right? And so it's something that all of us have to continue to manage. Um, And so understanding that, continuing to um, develop ways to manage that within your organization, so important. Um, And then I would say, um, you know, inclusive leadership is the the next one. You know, when we become leaders, um, it's usually based on our ability to do a great job as an individual contributor, but there's not that, um, that, you know, that teaching moment or those, you know, those set of classes that occur between that time that your paperwork gets signed for your promotion. And so how do you manage that learning curve, especially 
you know, in a more inclusive environment where employees, customers, clients um, are looking for inclusive environments. How do you lead in that? And what does that mean? And so um, I think that, a, you know, a lot of organizations are, are kind of stepping up and saying, okay, we need a little bit more training and in inclusive leadership. And what does that mean? Um, what does that feel like? How does that benefit our employees and, and increase retention and productivity and uh, innovation and all of those things that occur when you've got, you know, a culture of belonging and inclusive leaders? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, the the global piece, I absolutely, that resonates a lot with me too, is clients are increasingly saying like, hey, we're going to have our APAC division on this. So please make sure that it's not mm -hmm. just American history on a topic or an American perspective, having that global perspective and I think engaging um, and embedding DEI in, in global business units too. Mm -hmm. So it might, racism looks very, very different um, it, depending on the history, um, you know, in Asia, I know it's a lot more about the caste system versus here, you know, with obviously with slavery and abroad in Europe, it, you know, sometimes I get this like, oh, it doesn't happen here. I'm like, okay, well, right. <laughs> it just looks different. <laughs> That's happens exactly everywhere. right. Yeah. But, um, and, and inclusive leadership, I think that's a skill set now more than ever, right? How do you update? the principles of leadership because, you know, the stoic, uh, ideal worker mentality, always on, always right. You know, that's really not who people respond to. As a leader. Right. And so DEI that's principles right. can absolutely be threaded through how you train and how you promote your leaders and how you get them ready, ideally to be a people leader before they just start leading teams, which doesn't that's always right. happen. Oh, good stuff, Jackie. Um, yeah, I'm curious uh, with where, if you could look out in the future and just, I know a lot of organizations are budgeting for next year, thinking about what's next with DEI. Um, what would be some things that you see or would rec recommend to folks that want to stay focused on DEI, but might be thinking like, well, we've done the unconscious bias training. Like we've, you know, signed them up for an inclusive leadership course. We went through anti-racism, whatever the things they think mm -hmm. they've done, you know, we know. It's a journey, not a destination. You got to stay on it. What are some ways to stay on course with DEI? Yeah, I would say, you know, you want to make sure that you're measuring the effectiveness of what you're doing. And so understanding how your trainings or the, the trainings that you've um, given to your, your employee base is resonating with them. Are they, you know, practicing those things? How do they feel? that, you know, their, their teams are practicing. How are they feeling about new training? Um, has it been successful? So one, definitely analytics and, and making sure that you're measuring the effectiveness. Um, the next thing is, like you said, Julie, it's, it's not a, a destination. It's something that's an ongoing practice. And so um, reviewing your policies is another thing that you want to do on a continual basis to make sure they're inclusive. Because you, you want to be inclusive of all kinds of families, for example. So if you've got a maternity policy instead of a parental leave policy um, that incorporates different families and what families look like, um, you know, that's a, a, an issue. Um, and also, you know, as people are taking care of their children, but people are also taking care of um, relatives with disabilities or aging parents. And so making sure that you're really evaluating your, your policies to be inclusive of your employee base is another thing that you should do on an ongoing basis to make sure that, um, you know, it's effective and, and benefits your entire employee base. So what I'm hearing from you is uh, the systems side of things, more of the switch, uh, you know, measuring it, um, adjusting your policies and your systems. Because if you're saying the things and not doing the things, That's it doesn't right. really matter. That's right. And I always think the measurement piece is so interesting because people like struggle with this. Like, I don't know how to start measuring it. Mm -hmm. I can't ask people all this information. 
<laughs> and I, it's just interesting how we go to excuses rather than like with other problems in business, we would get creative. With That's that right. Piece. Um, so the measurement piece, I, I think is really interesting, Jackie, like what kind of things could folks measure to st- say like, I'm at point A, right? And I don't, here's what I think point B looks like. Like, how do I know that I get there? How do I know I'm doing the right things or that it's working? Absolutely. So you want to definitely measure the sentiment around your organization. Do people feel a sense of belonging? And if not, why? Um, so that's one. Another is, again, measuring um, the effectiveness of any programs that are already in place. Um, you also can measure... Um, you know, things like we, you know, every organization measures their turnover, but are you measuring turnover for your diverse employees, right? Because that can be an indicator of a problem. So understanding, you know, all the things that could be measured, seeing what you are measuring currently is important. But then, you know, again, those are some of the things that you can measure. You can also measure, um, you know, discrimination and harassment, Um, Because 24% of the workforce experiences discrimination and harassment. And that is significant. And a lot of organizations are like, oh, no, you know, you know, not my organization. Right. And, And the problem, Julie, is that so often leaders are nervous about getting the real understanding of where their employees are, you know, feel about their organization, they have these, you know, ideas of what they think based on information that's not really shared with the CEO, right? (laughs) How are things going? Great, right? You you know, (laughs) it's like a smiled sheet almost like, yeah, it's working, no problem here, look the other way. (laughs) That's exactly right. And really what you want to do is make sure you're consistently communicating what it is that you want to measure, why you're measuring that, and then what you're going to do with that information. Um, And you have to do that on a regular basis. And then, you know, start small, start with what you've been measuring, evaluate that, and then go a little bit at a time. There's a lot of things that you can measure, but determine what you're measuring currently, and then start, you know, adding on from there. Um, but it's it's so important because we can't change what we're not measuring, right? And so having that real understanding of of how your employee base is feeling about your organization and their ability to contribute is is so important to their success and and their longevity with your organization. Yeah, I love that the sentiment, um, some representation, and looking like you said across the employee experience, you know, yeah. turnover, promotions, hires, like holistically. Um, I, I love that because with the sentiment stuff, sometimes the pushback I'll get is like, well, I don't know. What if we ask and like, it's bad or like, what, right. what do we do? And I was like, well, just cause you ask doesn't mean that sentiment wasn't already there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so wouldn't you rather know than not know, but it, you know, we have a conflict risk averse type of a culture at some organizations that have that. Let's be nice. And let's mm-hmm. I have that kind of, I call it like the care bear mentality where everybody's yeah. just happy and you know, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> DEI does not mean that. Like, this is not an organization where we pretend everything's okay. We acknowledge that we have an opportunity to get better mm-hmm. and we're doing the work and measuring the work that matters and adjusting our strategy as we go, just like we would with any other business challenge. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. <gasps> the issue, Julie, is that so many organizations look at DEI as separate. Yeah. It's just another part of how you're doing business. It's just have the same level of accountability, same way that you're measuring it. You know, the same with um, having that as part of your um, professional development or performance metrics for your, um, you know, managers, et cetera. That right. needs to be part of their performance review, DEI. And so because it's, sometimes, you know, treated as a, an outside, right, practice or an outside program, right, that they're doing separate from the course of business. It needs to be fully integrated as part of how you do business, how you think about your marketing, how you're thinking about your recruiting and everything else. And so um, 
that I, you hit it right on the head. Like that separation is the reason why there's an issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it kind of goes full circle back to what you're saying about the economy and you know changing the business landscape. Like if you're threading this and embedding it in what you do, then it doesn't go up and down with the news cycle or the economy or what is happening in the world. It's just some, it's just how we do business. Like we commit to inclusion and it's threaded through all the pieces of how we do this. It's not ad hoc and it's not, you know, buried under HR or wherever, you know, <laughs> tends to Correct. be. Correct. Absolutely. Because, you know, with HR, the, the assumption is, okay, this is a compliance. Like I've got to sit through this training, right. And, and tick the boxes and, and then I'm done till next year. And that's, it's not that way. No, um, Everyone is responsible in your organization from your CEO to your board, right. To your interns for creating that culture of inclusion and, and what their personal responsibility is in that. And then what the corporate responsibility is. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Oh, Jackie, this has been such a blast to talk to you. I would love um, for our listeners to know more about how do they follow you? How do they get their hands on this amazing book, the Inclusive Language Handbook? Um, what are some ways that they can keep in touch and follow your work? Absolutely. So you can find the Inclusive Language Handbook at the Inclusive Language Handbook.com. Um, we have lots of great programming and free resources at the Diversity Movement.com. Um, so if you're not following, getting our newsletter, please feel free. Um, to join us there. And then uh, you certainly can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to connect. Awesome. 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 Well, Jackie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our listeners today. It has been an absolute treat to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Julie. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Allies are necessary for positive change. If you are on the journey to becoming an ally, we invite you to participate in our brand new Lead Like an Ally online program or get a copy of our new book, Allyship in Action, available on Amazon. Both are helpful tools that meet leaders where they're at and help provide tools for professional and personal settings. Head over to nextpivotpoint.com to get started today. Thank you.